Hey you, and welcome. My name is Mike, and in this whole video, we're gonna look uh, at a few things, you know, as we tend to do. One being a phone call, so look forward to that. Two being a guy named Pete, and three being a plot described as Machiavellian. So, sign me up. Mustache twirl time, can't grow one. We're going to Kansas City today, uh, not the one not in Kansas, the one that is, which is not confusing at all. And we'll look at a story that took over a decade to resolve. And when it did resolve, it did so in, um, kind of a poignant way. It's bananas. So, uh, let's give it a go. On the 8th of May, right, 2008, you might remember it, a guy named Olin Pete Coons Jr., he was driving his kids to school that, uh, that Monday morning. Pete, born in 1957, was a family man, proud husband to Dee, and dad to five children. Two of them were in the car, Melody and Ben, and Pete was very happy to spend a little extra time with his son and daughter as he drove them to school. This seems like a nice story. What happens next? That particular morning, as he was driving through the streets of Kansas City, Kansas, he was pulled over by the, by the police, by the popo, who were armed to the teeth. Pete was arrested. Arrested for a double homicide, if you can believe that. Pfft, Mondays, am I right? See, in the early morning hours of the day before, a call had been made to a woman's mother telling the mother that he, Pete, he was in the house and he was gonna kill her and her husband. The mother then got someone to call the police and they rushed over. They rushed over to find this woman and her husband murdered. They had been shot to death. A husband and wife are found murdered in their Kansas City, Kansas home. Tonight, police have one person in custody, but the investigation isn't over yet. Peggy Bright is live where it all happened, 78th and Speaker Road. Peggy. Well, Jerry, police got an anonymous call around 2.30 this morning to come to this little tan home you can see behind me. When the officers got here, they found the man and the woman were shot to death. Pete had been married to his wife, Dee, for almost 30 years, and as I said, together, they had five kids. He had worked for the U.S. Postal Service, and now they were saying he had gone postal. He was arrested for a double homicide. He was arrested for the murder of the Shrolls. Kathleen Shroll, she had worked in a credit union in Kansas City. Carl Shroll, her husband, he was a little bit older than his wife, and he was retired. Now, there were no signs of forced entry to the home. No busted in door, no broken windows, anything like that. There wasn't any kind of big mess either, like someone had made shite of the place. A 36 revolver was found right next to Kathleen's body. And when the police rocked up that early morning, they thought that, you know, upon entering, Kathleen had killed her husband and then herself. A murder-suicide. That was a conclusion the police had come to, you know, within 15 minutes of being in the house and seeing what they had seen. That's what the goo told them. Kathleen and her husband Carl had a daughter. Well, she was Carl's stepdaughter. Kathleen and Carl had met when she was 10 years old, and they had a granddaughter. They had actually been at the Shrolls earlier that night, the night of the murders, and had been planning on staying. Then Kathleen told her daughter that her and the hubby weren't getting on at the moment, so best leave it for tonight. When she was informed of what happened to her parents, you know, that police initially suspected it to be a murder-suicide, she was shocked. This was out of blue for her parents. You know, for something, Kathleen, to kill her husband and then herself? No. 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 Also, Kathleen was shot in the back of the head. Hard to kind of do that to yourself. Kathleen and Carl, uttered in this particular night in April 2008, it always seemed, you know, that they were happy together, in love with each other, you know, they were fun people to be around. Obviously, that night they were having a bit of a fight. Who doesn't? And then they ended up dead. Initially looked like a murder-suicide, which people thought, no, that seems drastic for Kathleen. 
I suppose that'd be drastic for anybody. It was then later that the police would learn of the last call Kathleen had made, a call to her mother, in which during the El Leo call, when she was having a yap away with her mother, she said this, quote, Peter is here in the house and he said he stole the lawnmower. He said he is going to kill Carl and he said he is going to kill me. And he said he had his tracks covered where no one will know who did it. Don't know what the lawnmower is about, but the call then cut off. My sister just called and she's had some run-ins with this one guy. She called him sister. He's there trying to kill her and her husband. He's there now. He says she said he's breaking in with a gun in his hand. Okay, and the guy that's supposed to be there, the suspect, what was his name, or do you know? What's his name? Pete. Pete Coons. Peter, being Olin Pete Coons Jr. Someone Kathleen knew. See, a few years prior, Kathleen had taken a part-time job. You know, aside from working in the credit union, she would look after the elderly. And one of the L fellows she was looking after was Owen Coons Sr., Pete's dad. Owen Sr., a widower, had been in his 80s, suffering from dementia when Kathleen had been his carer. When his wife, Norma, had died, he had given Kathleen some of her jewellery. And then, when he himself passed away in January 2007, she had been the beneficiary of his life insurance policy, and she also got his house. Olin Sr. only had one child, and that was Pete. But Kathleen would say that Pete, he'd been a drug user or some shite, so he got nothing. Things are beginning to become a little clearer. Now, Olin and Kathleen, apparently it wasn't just, you know, a care carey relationship. They had quite a close one, you know, father-daughter kind of style. Um, but then when he passed away and he left everything to his care, Kathleen, that then began a bitter uh, legal dispute between Pete and Kathleen. How bitter? Well, what happened at 2.20 a.m. on the 7th of April? Give you an idea. Before that, they did not get on well. A few days before the shooting, they had gotten into a verbal dispute at a shop, and Kathleen even thought Pete had stolen all the plumbing out of the house Olin Sr. had left her. How are you supposed to take a dump now? But it looked like the legal battle was coming to a close, and Kathleen was sure she would come out the victor. Not today, Pete said. So, police were at the scene after they'd been called and found both Kathleen and her husband, Carl. Then Kathleen's mother, she rocked up, she told him, tells me, oh, she just called me, she said it was a guy named Pete was in the house and he is the one who killed them. So that immediately then, what looked like a murder-suicide, quickly became a double homicide. And so it was the next morning, the 8th of April, as Pete was driving his children to school, they arrested him. The police then searched his house, his computers, his everything. I looked out the window and, and there were all the police cars lined up on the street and other vehicles. It was a shocking sight to the people who live around here. Police swarming around the home of 64-year-old Carl Schroll and his 45-year-old wife Kathleen Hadley Schroll. The Schroll's next door neighbors knew them well. Off camera, they told us they were wonderful, kind people, great neighbors who were always there for others. They also had a young granddaughter who visited frequently. The neighbors had no indication of trouble within the home and police were never called here before. That's why their murders are so mind boggling, even with the news that one person has been arrested. His family, you know, his wife, she said he'd been home all night. She could hear him snoring as he slept beside her. He'd gotten up maybe once or twice to go take a leak. That was it. He hadn't gone anywhere in the middle of the night. Their protestations fell on deaf ears, and he was charged with two murders. Pete went on trial about nine months later, in January 2009. The motive was the hatred he had for her, that she had stolen his inheritance. They had run-ins before, remember he had gotten in her face at the supermarket, and so... This was just escalation. He had burst into the house, bet Carl, because Carl was found with blood in his face. Then he took the Schroll's gun, shot Carl while he was in bed, and then executed Kathleen with a shot to the back of the head. Kathleen's mother, she took the stand, she told him about the call Kathleen had made before getting cut off. No, his defense was, well, there was, there was nothing physically linking him to the scene. No blood, his fingerprints weren't on the gun, no DNA, and his wife said he had been in bed all night long. 
His daughter said she saw him in the house at 2.20 a.m. when Kathleen was calling because she was up watching TV and, you know, he told her to go to bed and then she heard Pete going clickety clackety on the computer. So we have Pete seemingly alibied out by, by his family though, so. And then he got a phone call. But if he didn't do it, who did? Was it a murder-suicide? Well, Kathleen was just about to win a legal battle to win the old fellow's estate, so random person, but there were no signs of uh, fourth century or anything like that. So it went to the jury, and what did they return to us with? Well, they deliberated for two days, and then they came back with a very unusual verdict. Guilty. Guilty for killing Kathleen. Not guilty for killing Carl. I don't know how you could find him guilty of doing one and not the other, but somehow they did. P. Coons was sentenced to 50 years in prison. No parole. Wait, wait, it was a life sentence. Life sentence for him. Legally, he had murdered Kathleen, even though he denied it. A woman who may or may not have been the angel prosecutors portrayed her as during the trial. Something which Pete's family, after he was sent away, they contended with. They said she had taken advantage of Olin Sr. He was an old guy with Alzheimer's. One time, after not seeing Olin Sr. for quite a long time, they met him with Kathleen, and Olin Sr. had bruises on him, scratches on him, like he'd been abused, maybe by his caregiver. Pete had even filed an elder abuse claim against Kathleen, but nothing ever came of it. About a year later, Pete would get a new trial, after the defense learned the prosecution had withheld evidence. See, you remember Pete's daughter said, he had been on the computer that night. Well, computer records proved he was on it or someone was on it. So while the defense th thought they had a better chance, we have proof he was, you know, at, at home when the, the shootings were done. The prosecution also had a better case because this time they had a witness. They had a witness who had been with Pete in jail and he said he had confessed to him that he had done it. The inmate's name, who are we talking about? AKA Pete. 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 Okay. He told me that uh, he thought about doing something to these people and nobody was going to be able to figure out he did it. He would tell me stuff about his criminal case and get real mad and, and talk about committing the crime and okay. get away with it. You used the words uh, repeating what Pete had told you that he, quote, covered his tracks. Oh, he said that multiple times. Okay. Uh, he told me that uh, he thought about it for quite a long time uh, about doing something to these people about what they did to his dad and nobody was going to be able to figure out he did it. Did he indicate to you how he exited his house in order not to alert or stir anyone within the home? He told me that he went out the bedroom window, that he had a hard time getting out the bedroom window. He claims that he was like real, real big at the time, but he was laughing about it, but okay. he finally got out the window. He said, I went over there in my Jeep. I didn't use my personal van, my family van. He also, in the same conversation, told me that he had his wife sell the Jeep to get rid of it so there wouldn't be a rental. That swung it and he was found guilty again. Now, nothing in this case makes sense. The plot is all over the place. Why would Kathleen call her mother? saying that Pete was in the house and going to kill her. Why not call the cops, where the call would be recorded? The prosecution said Pete came into the house to kill her, sans gun, and then Bet Carl took their gun and killed them both, which seems unrealistic. The informant said that Pete had snuck out of the window. Pete at the time was over 250 pounds. He would have had better luck running through the wall like the Kool-Aid man than climbing out through a window. The informant also said that Pete had drove, driven over in his red car when Pete had sold the red car months before the murders. He had sold it when he was retired because even delivering the post was too much for him. But the system wasn't having it. And years went by. Years until 2018, when a new DA rocked up and began a conviction integrity unit, checking for wrongful convictions. And Pete wrote a letter. A few new things were revealed by the various attorneys and the Midwestern Innocence Project. Carl had a bloody face that night, and it was assumed Pete had beaten him upon the head. But then another bullet was found, 
so it looked like Carol had actually been shot in the face and the bullet scraped his face. So there's only injuries from a gun is the point. A gun though that didn't have Pete's DNA or fingerprints on it. But it did have Kathleen's on her left hand was found to be gunshot residue. The jailhouse informant would later admit he had lied. He had lied uh, hoping to you know get a reduced sentence. And it would also come out later that the prosecution had forced him to confess. They knew he was a uh, like an untrustworthy witness, but they had forced him to testify and threatened him that they would give him more years if he didn't. And then a couple of things about Kathleen uh, came out. Pete had been right. She had been taking advantage of Olin Sr. And she knew it, Pete knew it, and the law would soon know it. Kathleen was not just allegedly physically abusing Olin Sr. She was financially abusing him too. She began cutting him off from his family and controlling his finances. A year before Olin Sr. passed away, in a six month time frame, over $28,000 in checks had been made out to Kathleen from Olin. $12,000 had been withdrawn from his accounts, he'd gotten a new credit card, and Kathleen had also been added to the deed of the house. The bank later froze his account because of suspicious activity, but by that stage there was nothing left. Then Kathleen had been made the beneficiary of his life insurance, something that had been done without the power of attorney. Pete was suing her, not because, you know, he was pissed he had been left out of the will. He was suing her because she was abusing his dad. None of this came out during the trial. The jury did not learn of any of this. And it turned out that Olin Sr. wasn't the only person she was frauding and embezzling. No, not her. Her job, the credit union, she had taken almost 12 grand from them, falsifying checks. And this was all going to come out in that suit. So, with the walls closing in, she framed Pete Coons. She killed her husband. She then called her mom. The call was real, because call already proved it. Called her mom, saying Pete was there, and then she killed herself to make it look like she had been executed. The police had been right from the start. It was a murder-suicide. And then, with Pete in jail, all of Kathleen's assets would go to her daughter. What a plot. You know, Freeman, the son of the guy you've been stealing from, out of pure spite. It's a good one, but not in a good way. I think they make mistakes with everybody. There's good police work, and there's not so good police work. And I can even understand how sometimes an overload of work causes people to do less than a perfect job. I just hate the fact that they did less than a perfect job and cost me so much of my life. I believe that uh, the police, after they heard that phone call, said, we've got the guilty guy, we're not looking any farther. I don't think they ever did. I know I'm innocent as long as everybody else finds out I'm innocent, we'll be just fine. With all of this, there was a third trial, and this time it went well. In November 2020, Pete Coons was a free man. And as such today, I told the court that we will dismiss this case and not be requesting a new trial. And Mr. Coons, I believe, is in the process of being released and will be able to go home today. Today was a good day. Justice was served. I don't, uh, I'm not mad at anybody. I was sure I would be. I never thought I was coming home. I was sure hopeful. I prayed for it all of the time. I didn't need a miracle, I just needed the truth. And I got a miracle of truth. So, that's a double blessing. I am so perfectly content with my decisions that I can sit here in this chair now and tell you I was offered a five-year plea deal and I didn't take it. And I sure would have liked to have went home, but I would have been a felon forever and I would have had to say I did something I didn't do. A few years down the road, it's just a speed bump in the rearview mirror. But by that stage, he was a sick man. He had cancer. 
a lung cancer that had gone undiagnosed and untreated while he was in prison. And so, 180 days after being released from a prison he had wrongly spent 12 years in, on the 21st of February 2021, at just 64 years old, P. Coons passed away. Kathleen was a fucker. Murdered her husband, then offed herself and did it in like a back of the head way to make it look like somebody else had done it. Framing the son of the guy she had been stealing from as a final middle finger. Pretty, pretty dark. And I'm sure if she was watching from beyond the grave, she was delighted that he ended up spending 12 years behind bars for a crime she committed. Sad story though for, for P2. After all that, he only got a few months with his family and he was off again. Hard to believe shit like this is real. And as we see in the stories we talk about here on that chapter, time and time again, if you told me this like out of a novel or something, you'd laugh at it. Is it a good thing or a bad thing that truth is stranger than fiction? It's a thinker. Thank you so much for watching. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to do so and be here with this guy. Here, go on. I'll see you as always real soon in the next old video. Until then, please look after yourselves. Okay.